Good morning to you all. Welcome to Envoy Crisis Management Webinar Week. The second module today is going to see us discuss the reasoning of understanding leadership decision making. First of all, a little bit about me uh, and, and how I've got to be here. Uh, my career has been military orientated for over 30 years as a Royal Marine, which has exposed me to all levels of decision making in mixed environments and under varying pressures. And I'm extremely grateful and privileged to have had the experience over that period. Uh, and I've been taught by some talented leaders and excellent mentors, which is still to me the culture investing in the development of giving something back to those who started or starting that journey also. I've not always got it right, but I have learned the importance of learning from my mistakes. And I think that the satisfaction of getting it right increases the confidence to lessen the errors. I'm a keen hill walker, mountaineer, but also canoeist. And my affinity with the water is a precious trait. And I hope it never wanes, or my body hopes the opposite. I've also had the pleasure of being involved with high performance sport at world class level through rugby, where the skills of leadership under pressure have been discussed and used to benefit those that take part. However, all those military days are now behind me, and I find myself sort of outside my comfort zone, immersed in business through employee crisis management. Uh, and I'm now lucky enough to have the chance for working externally for the AA, where I've been for about three or four months now. Uh, and although it's not military orientated, what I have learned is that the mind mapping processes and strategies of leadership into business that I've experienced so far, they all remain the same. So if I combined the experiences learned with business, I hope to bring change and understanding. So a new chapter in my life begins. I understand that those listening today will have a mixed experience of leadership within different roles and at different levels. Therefore, some of the content we discussed today may not be new to you, but a refresher, which is fine. But for some, it's a chance to learn and continue their development. So the aim of today is to give ideas and different perspectives to assist you when working with your leadership teams and hopefully reinforce and integrate decision making strategies and processes within your organisations. We're going to cover a wide and ranging topic of leaderships together today, but if the end you'd like a more in-depth presentation on a covered topic, please inquire through the addresses that I will uh, give out at the end. Okay, so, so what do you think? As a leader or leadership team, it's our responsibility, your responsibility to make a decision. I think it's fair to say that as leaders, it's our responsibility to make decisions. Now, whether they turn out to be right or wrong, I think the greatest burden is that we place on our colleagues is not to make them. So here are a few questions for you to ponder. How many people listening today have made decisions as a leader or part of a leadership team? Now, no doubt at some point, you'll have gone through a thought process, a reasoning or gut instinct that led you to making that decision. Now, were you under pressure mentally, physically, financially, or was it time sensitive? Were you constrained? Have you ever had the decision uh, and you have to make it in isolation? You know, most of us who have had that experience will have been influenced by various factors, such as information, facts, and to some extent, those who surround us. You know, we can be hugely influenced by the right or wrong information, our associates and their prejudices, or our adversaries, competitors. But you know, when we decide we need to listen to others, you know, we need to collaborate together. Have your decisions been right and wrong? Or have they been consistent and popular? And have you ever reversed your decision? You know, what does that say about you as a leader? Does it make you a good or bad leader or decision maker? You know, we need to be consistent in our thoughts and approach. So the aim today, as leaders, you recognize that the ability to make sound and timely decisions stem from knowledge, experience, trusting your abilities, but also empowering others around you to demonstrate theirs. There are many attributes and factors which inform leadership and decision-making. This discussion will cover the following. We're gonna look at understanding the strategy and process. We'll look at the factors affecting our decision-making as leaders. Uh, and then we're gonna look at leading through a crisis. But first, we need to understand the strategy and process. How do we get there? 
The importance placed upon decision making is crucial if leaders are to guide their employees through a crisis, manage the tensions across organisations and balance the well-being of workforces. And when the stakes are high and the territory unfamiliar, the ability to operate in a frenetic and diverse environment whilst making the right decision is paramount to the success and growth of our organisations. So let's look at heuristic and analytical. Now, both of these two strategies end in a decision, but they are very different in their approach. The heuristic approach is a quicker process. An example of this is the OODA loop. Now, OODA is more concerned with synthesizing an action out of an incomplete data set, since we can never recognize all the variables that we're forced to deal with in any environment. So we must be able to make a decision that we believe will give us the highest probability for success. The synthesis of an action from the observation and orientation of a complex and unfamiliar environment subject to frequent and unpredictable change or a VUCA environment is the essence of OODA loop, but we can talk a little bit more about this later. The heuristic approach learns by actions, by a practical doing, a practical approach, trial and error, the value placed on experience, it relies on common sense, but it also seeks a satisfactory, a satisfactory outcome. The analytical approach is a slower pace. An example of this is a PDCA cycle, a plan, do, check and act cycle. Something that you would associate with a risk assessment. So PDCA cycle or loop is primarily an analytical approach that can be used with great success in a completely internal manner. You know, you don't need to consult the external environment or adjust to unfolding circumstances to make the PDCA loop work. It can be used with great success on a shop floor with the data that you've got available. So our analysis, which involves the use of a complete data set to reach conclusion, that we use the data to decide how to proceed. Now we can check and act to confirm or reject the hypothesis our analysis has led us to later. But the analytical approach learns by analysis, a step-by-step -step process, something we're, a lot of us are used to, quantitative information and models and it seeks an optimal solution. Now, two quite different ways of coming to a solution, but both have merits that could be used in different scenarios. And now, no doubt, you'll identify strands from each strategy that you have used whilst debating ideas and decisions within your organizations. So let's look a bit at cognitive function. Decision-making, regardless of what level, is a strategy and process that's regarded as a cognitive function. You know, it's an intellectual process resulting in the selection of a belief or a course of action among several alternative possibilities. This does require all aspects of perception and openness and reasoning, but decision-making is the process of identifying and choosing alternatives based on the values, preferences, and beliefs of the decision-maker. Every decision-making process produces a final choice, which may or may not prompt an action. Big bet decisions. Although infrequent, are high risk and have the potential to shape the future of a company. It requires cross-party collaboration and engagement by senior leadership. A good example is the current pandemic and decision-making at government level, where the decisions they've got to make carry very high stakes. Risk-aware or risk-averse. This is a subject that we see organisations when confronted with unfamiliar ter ter uh, terrain, either shy away or look to exploit the opportunity. How willing are you as an organization to see a current problem as an opportunity to gain ground or a chance to restructure? The current pandemic will see companies embrace risk to some extent to further their own goals. However, the risk is not changing your company's structure and becoming outdated and unable to keep up with processes in today's competitive market. This picture, although funny, really sums it all up. Are you willing to take the risk and move away from Europe if we're talking about Brexit? How much are we influenced by the people that surround us, listening to their prejudices or their biases? Have you got the strength of character and culture to go your own way and use that risk to your advantage? Okay, let's, we're gonna to focus today on military sport and business, but let's look at the military concept just now. Now, the military invests heavily in the development 
equipment and empowerment of its personnel, creating an environment and providing doctrine for leadership and decision making. And this is something we need to do in business. I think the importance of preparation and exercising with the acceptance of making errors is all part of a learning process, which in turn does increase the rate of success. Now, business need to adopt this. They need to learn from this and they need to let their people make mistakes in a controlled environment where they don't feel any retribution. Now, many former servicemen today that I know have made a very successful transition into industry using the same methodology that they've learned and now they apply it within senior leadership and its environment. And as I mentioned, the dynamics of leadership and critical thinking are no different at the top of an organization. It's just the environments and the people that shape them. Let's look at the OODA loop. Now, the OODA loop was developed by a military strategist, Colonel John Boyd. And he applied the theory to the concept of operations process. We'll talk a bit more later. His thought process centered on providing leadership and management the ability to react quickly to unfolding events and gain the upper hand. The military approach of a born of conflict has migrated across the business and sport, enabling decision-making quickly through a very agile approach. The key to OODA loop is to obscure the intentions or your intentions and make them unpredictable to your opponent while you simultaneously clarify his. Now we see this all the time in boxing, we see this all the time in rugby, but it's so fast, you know, they don't even know they're doing it, it just happens. Now the OODA loop is a decision enabling cycle which uses four principles. Observe what is happening around me. The entire process begins with observation of data from the world environment and the situation you find yourself in. On a short scale, this is represented by the things your senses take in. What are you seeing? What are you hearing? What are you smelling? Now, this is probably the most notable when you find yourself arriving at a location that you've never been to before. You know, your body's natural response is to examine the space around you. But over longer time scales, this applies to compiling the information regarding your goals, aspirations, and the current scenario you find yourself in. Now, in a business term, this can come in the form of market research, auditing, or other methods of gathering information, which will be critical to form a hypothesis, but later plans of action regarding your specific goals. The next phase of the cycle we move on to is to orientate, the processing of the information. Now, this is the moment that we take in all the information garnered during the observation phase and begin to process it. We're trying to make sense of it. We consider the implications of each aspect of our situation and environment, what each facet means to us and to other people. This is probably the phase of a cycle that requires the most practice. If you can develop the mental process to find orient, orient, orientating new information, then you can take your decision-making power and speed to new heights. You know, we need to practice the different mental patterns used to analyze data, you know, how we see it, how we break it down into constituents, and how then we can relate that information to an area that's crucial to our business. Alternatively, if this is a long-term decision that we're preparing for, we may need to preempt using our data by developing, adapting, rehearsed mental process by which we can evaluate information. So through rehearsals, we can create a pattern of examination which is second nature to us and will therefore be able to perform our analysis in a far shorter time frame. But also this approach will reduce the number of unforeseen outcomes at the end of the process significantly, as all the routes will be accounted for. The next phase in the cycle is the decide phase. So decide will be the outcome of and is entirely reliant on your orientating phase. Ultimately, you should now be close to deciding your next step together and maybe other subsequent steps. But this is based on the data that we were presented with. Yeah, and our orientating processes. You know, we may end up with any number of potential pathways to follow, but it's now about narrowing down these options to one or two, sort of more feasible routes of, to success. But don't forget that this is a science. Effectively, we're forming a hypothesis, a best guess of our actions, implications that will be based on the analysis of our evidence presented to us. Practice and experience can also help with this. You know, knowing like the outcomes of certain different practices and decisions can have an overlap onto others. But it's important that the outcomes 
of our previous experiences and the orientating phase gets us as close to an accurate prediction of our future actions and impacts as possible. So the final part of the cycle is where we put our decisions to the test. You know, action is the final part of the cycle, as you mentioned, and, but it can also be used to restart the analytical processes. You know, we are, of course, hoping the plan will be successful, but whether it is or isn't, we should be learning from the effects beyond the, the obvious. Just to remember that the scope of our actions may have far reaching consequences, and we've always got to be able to be prepared and ready to analyze even the most successful projects in depth in order to achieve our continuous improvement. Just remember that this is a cycle, it never ends, but it needs information to keep going. So if we align our methodologies, um, we'll find out, or we've discovered so far, that strategy and a process used by one type of leadership can be used in a wider aspect to suit another type of leader in a different environment, and it can be used to good effect. But it's all about, as leaders, our receptiveness, our application, and our appetite for risk also. So when we look at commercial operations, whilst the business and sport and the military world may see short results of OODA loop, the business world sees an extended long duration game at work. They study customer activity. You could say that's the observational phase. The way we position the business to address concerns and improve performance is the orientation stage. Coming up with a plan of action to execute new strategies is the decision phase, and then the execution at grassroots level is our action phase. This could take months or years as businesses rise and fall, competitions fold, and new empires take their place. So the processes, and you know, although we consider the processes aspect of decision making more with an analytical framework, it is possible to weave certain aspects of the heuristic and analytical concept to give a holistic view. Because industry responds well to a process driven methodology, I think, but it can also slow it down, hence the preferred OODA loop faster method. And something we all like to think that we possess and are is, is agile. You know, while most organizations boast of agility and a dynamic approach, what is it that makes an organization agile? Well, in my mind, it is the, uh, the ability to, to restructure to adjust our strategies on a continuous basis, you know, we need to be horizon scanning. We can never afford to get comfortable. I would also say empowering employees. I think it's very, very important to make sure we empower our employees to make key decisions on challenging projects, because this is key to stability, but also continued development for all. I also think their ability to respond to ambiguity and uncertainty with flexibility and speed is important. And lastly, we've got to view anticipated change as an opportunity for transformation. And this really depends whether we're risk aware or risk adverse. It's your choice. So what I've done is, or what we've done, is we're, we're going to look at a simplified approach based on a, a, an estimate style. Now, it's probably fair to say that each senior leadership team will have their own preferred style of coming to a decision and a trusted method of planning it to reach a decision. However, if we break it down into stages, it helps our thought process. So here's a simplified approach based on a, a military style estimate that I've taken and now putting into business. And it talks about phases and processes now, it might rhyme with your constant thought process. It might even help it to some extent. So the first thing we've got to do is firstly, make the right decision, okay? And we need to make that decision in recognizing what is the problem or the opportunity. You know, if we don't know what the problem is, if we don't know what the problem is, then we can't address it. We need to determine why this decision will make a difference to our customers and also to our employees. And we need to be open and prepared to receive feedback, good or bad, because this is part of being a leader, the decision-making process by accepting others' opinions. The next thing we need to do is process that information and data. So we need to gather our information so we can make a decision. And we need to base it on the facts and the data. Now this requires making a value judgment determining what information is relevant to the decision at hand, but also along with how we get it. You know, we've got to ask ourselves, 
what is it that we need to know in order to make the right decision? Then actively seek out anyone who needs to be involved. Now, as I said before, decisions should never be made in isolation. Leadership's about involving our colleagues. The managers seeking out a range of information to clarify their options once they've identified an issue that may require you know, decision-making processes to occur. The managers may seek to discern the potential causes of a problem. Now, the people and processes involved in the issue and any constraints placed in the decision-making process is invaluable here. The next we need to do, we need to identify the alternatives or the courses of action, what we call a COA. Now, once we have a clear understanding of the issue, we need to try and clarify or identify the various solutions at our disposal. Now, it's likely that we'll have many different options when it comes to making our decision, but it's important to remember that we need to come up with a range of options. In the end, this will help us determine which course of action is the best way to achieve our objectives. Now, Inveroy has a template on their website, which is made up consisting of a, a course of action structure, and it's there to help you. Now, if you'd like to download it, after this process, we'll speak to Matthew and we will endeavour to get one of these covers onto you to help you. The next thing we need to do is we need to balance the facts. So in this thing, we need to evaluate the facts for desirability, feasibility and acceptability to know which alternative is best. Managers need to be able to weigh the pros and cons. And in completion of that, select the option that has the highest chance of success. It may be helpful to seek out a trusted second opinion to gain a new perspective on the issue at hand. The next thing we need to do is you need to choose amongst the alternatives. You know, when it's time to make that decision, we've got to be sure that we understand the risks involved with our chosen route. First of all, are they acceptable? You know, are we risk aware or risk averse to this choice? We also may need to choose a combination of alternatives now that we fully grasp all the information and potential risks. We need to form a plan. We need to create a solution. Now we create a plan for implementation. Now this involves identifying what resources are required and gathering or gaining support for employees and stakeholders. We then need to get others on board with our decisions. And this is a key component of executing our plan effectively. So we need to be preferred to address any questions or concerns that may arise. We need to be transparent to gain the trust of our colleagues. It's probably one of the most important things. And finally, we need to review again and again, because it's often overlooked, but it is an important step in the decision-making process. And it's important because it helps us to evaluate our decision for effectiveness. So at the end of the day, you've got to ask yourself what you and your team learned from this, You know what you did well, but also what can you improve for next time? So what factors affect our decision-making as leaders? You know, leaders and leadership teams are faced with and affected by various constraints and factors which they've got to overcome. And I think it's important because if they're to continue as a leader or a leadership team, if they're to generate success, wealth and reputation credibility, if they're to gain the loyalty and trust of their employees, but also they're to grow a positive culture. I think regardless of the environment, although the obstacles and pressures may be different, the goals I've just mentioned are similar, if not the same. You know, whether you're in government, business or the military, the decision-making process will have at some point be conflicted by cultural, human, political and economic factors, which will impact on how and when defining decisions have to be made. So as we'll discover later, the cultural and human aspect plays a significant part in how organis uh, organisations operate. It's the responsibility of senior leadership to set the cultural parameters, but also ensure that those within it display the qualities that they expect of them. It all starts at the top. So whether your organization culture rotates around the clan, hierarchical, market, or autocracy framework, the ability of leaderships to make decisions will be impacted to some degree by their culture traits. So remember, your culture is your brand, your brand is your culture. So the question is, as individuals or teams, what can we use to our advantage and what must we be aware of? Now, whether your approach or technique to decision making is heuristic or moral an uh, analytical, the human aspect of decision making and thinking can add certain nuances on how we resolve a problem or come to a decision. So we've got to be in tune with these factors, but this will help 
This will help and heighten our awareness of this process. So past experiences. Now, past experiences or decisions influence the decisions that people make in the future. It stands to reason that when something positive results from a decision, people are more likely to decide in a similar way or given a similar situation. But on the other hand, people tend to avoid repeating past mistakes. You know, this is significant to the extent that future decisions made based on past experiences are not necessarily the best decisions. But I think successful leaders learn from past experiences and those of others. And I think they're influenced by the successes of their peers and how they achieved it. Um, setting personal leadership goals and encouraging feedback from your staff and your colleagues. You know, tackling new challenges outside our comfort zones. I'm outside my comfort zone in business, but I'm learning quickly. I'm just applying the same leadership principles I've learned to a new environment. But, you, you know, we never push our limits. We'll never fail and we'll never learn. Cognitive biases. Now, I'm sure as you know, Cognitive biases are thinking patterns based on observations and generalizations that, that lead to memory errors, inaccurate judgments and faulty logic. But we're consistently making decisions throughout the day in our work, at home and out in public. You know, in all decisions, there are huge numbers of factors at play which guide our choices, some we're aware of and some we're not. You know, we may not be aware of the subconscious biases or conscious biases which guide our decision making processes. You know, and they do take away from choice we may not even see as options. But if we are managers, leaders, this can affect the strength of our leadership and create negative consequences as well as positive ones. So some of the common biases you might have heard are belief, hindsight and omission. Now, belief is the overdependence on your prior knowledge in arriving at a decision. Hindsight is where people tend to readily explain an event as inevitable once it has opened or a mission bias, where people have a propensity to omit information perceived as risky. But here are some you might not be aware of, or might be of use to you to know. Authority and ambiguity bias. Now, authority bias favors the opinions of authority figures within the team, rather than taking into consideration the ideas of a whole group. This bias works under the assumption that those in authority positions have better innovation skills than those in lower positions. Now, this closes off possibilities for innovation by simply not considering them. So you might hear people say on occasion, our management won't allow that, or no, nobody would be interested in a product like that. Now that's wrong, but you need to be alive to it because it does happen. Ambiguity bias. Now no one likes ambiguity, especially in business. So the ambiguity bias favors options with clear outcomes rather than those which are risky. This huge Im impacts on innovation and experimentation because it completely cuts off or cuts out the possibility for change. You know, in our personal lives, this can end the possibility for new experiences because it limits us to the same everyday routines. So if you hear people saying, how do we even know about work or that's too risky? Again, you need to be alive to this. You need to be aware of it so you can sort of counter that. Okay, so let's talk about the escalation of commitment sunk outcomes. So people make decisions based on an irrational escalation of commitment. That is, Individuals invest large amounts of time, money and effort into a decision to which they feel committed. People will tend to continue to make risky decisions when they feel responsible for the sunk costs, time, money and effort they spend on a project. So individual differences, including age and SES or socioeconomic status. So this is where a combination of age Socioeconomic status and cognitive bias all influence our decision making. Our individual differences are impacted upon by our age as cognitive functions decline. Therefore, the potential and our ability to make decisions also decline. You know, when people believe that what they decide matters, they're more likely to make a decision. For example, individuals' voting patterns show that people will vote more readily when they believe their opinion is indicative of the attitudes of the general population as well as when they have a regard for their own importance and their outcomes. People vote when they believe their vote matters. When I'm gonna talk about VUCA or VUCA, however you pronounce it, and it means volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Now, it is something that is very common and applicable to the world in general today. Uh, and again, we see this crossover from one type of environment into another. So, 
VUCA came about actually in the US through an army war college and it, was in, it introduced the VUCA at the end of the Cold War because it considered the Cold War to be a volatile and certain and complex sort of multilateral world. Okay, but it first introduced into a business environment, I think it was 1987. And what it did, it drew, it drew on the leadership theories of Warren Bennis and Bert Manus. Now these were two well-respected leaders who identified strategies from that environment of the Cold War for companies to follow. And they used VUCA to describe or to reflect on the volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity of the general conditions and situations that leaders faced and followed. You know, we see unpredictable events happening outside an organization. They can be negative or positive, but either presents great VUCA, which makes it harder for leaders to make uh, a, a general decision. You know, I think a good example of this is a positive complexity is a product going viral and becoming an internet sensation. But a negative aspect is the hopelessness of this Tunisian fruit cell I'm about to tell you about. So in 2010, Mohamed Bouazizi, a young fruit seller, was cited by the local police for not having a license to sell fruit. The police tried to extort the license fee from him, and it was only $7, but that was more than he made in a day. So in an act of despair and protest, he took the, he took the, the step the radical step and he set fire to himself as a protest and he did it in front of the local council office and in doing this he raised the anger and protest of the whole arab youth pictures were taken and it went viral through social media and the news demonstrations were held riots followed this lasted for 30 days now this resulted in the president leaving and stepping down after 23 years and so began the arab spring Similarly, Bashir al-Assad from Syria faced an uprising. He didn't step down, and instead he ensued civil war, causing mass refugees, which affected Europe and Britain. The public discontent, compounded by other factors such as financial disparity, burdened the healthier countries such as Britain, and people do believe that this led to a Brexit vote. Now that is VUCA, VUCA in its extreme. So, VUCA is used to reflect on conditions and situations. So let's look at VUCA in a more business-like approach. Okay, and this is what we'll see. We're gonna see volatility. This is where the challenge is unexpected or unstable, and it may be of unknown, dura unknown duration, but it's not hard to understand. We use this period to gather our information. An example of this is a price fluctuating after a natural disaster. You know, it takes a supplier offline. And a good example of this is the effects of COVID-19 impacting on the oil sectors. Now, a solution is to build resilience into our organization. It may be expensive, but it needs to match the risk. Next, we look at uncertainty. You know, there may be a lack of information at this time. If an event has happened, we may know the cause and the potential effects. Change is possible, but it's not a given. You know, this is maybe a competitor's pending product, which blurs the future of the business and market. So we need to invest in information, collect and share, add information analysis networks to help reduce the uncertainty. Next, we look at complexity. This event or situation has many interconnected parts and variables. Some information is available or can be predicted, but the volume and nature of it can be overwhelming. An example is conducting business in many countries with all unique regulatory requirements, tariffs, and cultural values. You know, you could restructure, employ specialists, and build up resources. And the final part is ambiguity. You know, current relationships between companies and the markets are now unclear. We are in the area of unknowns of unknowns. You know, we're moving into an immature or emerging markets. It can also be an experiment or even expeditionary. You need to test environment and learn the lessons experienced. Again, are you risk aware or risk averse? So this is the new normal. VUCA is the new normal, people are saying. But now we're aware of the areas of risk and uncertainty. How can we prepare ourselves to lessen the impact and the outcomes? Well, in my mind, leaders need to develop the following. They need to develop a vision. You know, as leaders, we need to look ahead and horizon scan. What are the future threats? You know, what are the challenges which could destabilize our, our industry and the economy? We need to develop understanding. You know, only do we 
need to understand the unfolding event or situations, but we need to know how our employees will react and what support do they need to deal with this and sustain their output to succeed. We need clarity. Employees need clear direction and tasking to be effective. So we need to be crystal clear when we communicate and promote teamwork and collaboration. But you know, this will give our people a clear direction and encourage them to solve complex problems together. And finally, we need agility. We need to fight ambiguity with agility. We need to stay adaptable even during uncertain times. And we need to encourage our people to learn new skills. We need to stimulate debate and we need to embrace creativity. So if we're going to beat or confront VUCA, you know, we need to lead our people through that, you know, and we need to be direct, understandable, reliable, but we also need to be trustworthy. And it also leads us on to our next topic, leading through a crisis. The first thing to do is don't panic. However, what is a crisis? So the definition of a crisis in the Oxford English Dictionary is a time of intense difficulty or danger. A time when a difficult or important decision must be made. We as leaders need to lead and we need to lead our people. But the real test of leadership doesn't occur when everything is smooth sailing, and I'm sure you know that. Rather, leadership is at times tested during a crisis. You know, the way a leader behaves and acts during a crisis will establish their credentials as a good leader or a poor one. There's no handy manual out there that can guide a leader through a crisis, but we can plan to avoid failure to some extent. Now, while there can be certain procedures and processes in place that prevent a crisis from happening, each new crisis is unique in its own way, with its own problems and quirks, and will require a different approach from the one that you may have used before. Now, very often, the unpredictable nature of crisis means that leaders have no time to prepare. Hence, the need for planning and exercising our teams. Secondly, there's no telling how long a crisis will take to blow over. The time period can range from a day or two to over a few years, as we're all about to find out. The way in which we deal with a crisis requires our leaders to be alive to the following. And I would say confidence, transparency and integrity. You know, during a crisis, people are going to look to you, to us, for the next step and for reassurance. And if a leader projects fear and unease, that unease will transmit to everyone else, much like a contagious disease. But it is necessary for leaders to look like they are the masters of the situation. You know, employees need someone they can rely on, not someone they need to reassure. Integrity is key as well. You know, while the urge to state everything's going to be fine, is it, is it going to be overwhelming? It's important for us to be realistic as leaders. You know, they, we or they need to trade a fine balance in stating the magnitude of the situation. We need to be decisive, direct and adaptable. There will be occasions when leaders need to make quick decisions or hard decisions. A crisis is one of them. Leaders need to be able to make decisions in high tempo situations. And in some cases, they might need to make hard decisions. The ones that are not gonna win them any points or, or profit. And there will be times when there is no time to waste or even ponder the pros and cons of a decision. Now, even at a leisurely pace, leaders who take action, who are decisive and who are open to adapting their decisions to suit the needs of a situation are, are going to have more success. I would say whether in a crisis than a leader who chooses to wait, and wait not to take action, which is a decision itself, but not a great one. Don't let chaos control you, you've got to take charge. You know, in a crisis, a work environment can very quickly devolve chaos because of all the emotions running high. You know, stress, fear, they're all at the forefront, but it's imperative for a leader to take control and stop the panic from spreading. In fact, this is often the first thing a leader has to do when news of a crisis breaks. This might involve quickly delegating tasks or simply bringing a room to order. Either way, it's only possible to begin a crisis action plan with everyone involved is focused and determined to complete the task in hand. Always exercise caution. You know, our crisis is not an excuse to throw caution to the wind and risk it all unless a worst case scenario occurs. And there's literally no other option, but instead leaders have to not only lead away, but also be very measured in their approach. 
This is a case of quickly evaluating all the facts and then making a calculated decision about what will be the best course of action. There will be times when a rapid response is needed, but this skill still needs to be developed over time. And lastly, you need to be positive. Easier said than done sometimes. You know, how does one stay positive when everything that could possibly go wrong is happening? Leaders don't have to be blind optimistic, even when the outcome seems to stay otherwise. However, it is important to keep positive and motivated until the worst of the crisis has passed. Once insecurity finds a way, it very quickly morphs into crippling self-doubt. And this can prevent leaders from making the hard choices that you're going to have to make someday if you haven't made already. So coming towards the end of our presentation now, the summary, I think as a leader, you know, it's our responsibility, your responsibility to make a decision, but never make it in isolation. We need to vary our strategy, you know, whether it's heuristic or analytical, it's good to change it. You need to trust your ability, but we also need to empower the ability of, us, of others around us. And also don't forget that crisis can also pre uh, present opportunities. Be risk aware, don't be risk averse, but it's your choice at the end of the day. Now, as I said before, we've covered a large range of topics today. If there's anything you would like to contact us about a certain subject, we can go back into that in greater depth for you, which we're very happy to do. And please don't forget that today is not just about Envoy Crisis Management, it's also about uh, a nice donation from your good selves to Erskine. So that is our presentation. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, and I hope you look forward to tomorrow uh, uh, where we'll start with module three. Thank you very much for your time.